Welcome to Compass Church at Home. I'm Matt Myers. And I'm Ashlyn Hankey, and we are so glad to connect with you. I don't know how your week has been, if you've been able to get out a little more, or if you're still stuck at home. No matter what things are looking like for you, though, we're glad you've landed at Compass today, and we don't want you to keep this to yourself. So take a second and share this service on social media. One simple post from you can have a big impact on someone else's day or maybe even their life. Yeah, you know, another way we make an impact in the lives of others is through something called the Dollar Club. If you're not familiar with it, the Dollar Club is one of our primary ways of helping people in our church who are going through a tough time financially. This week we received a, a special gift that's allowing us to give not just one, but two Dollar Club gifts. That's awesome. The first one was given to a family that has had several hospital stays over the last year or so. They're living on Social Security and covering all the co-pays has been challenging. The bills had been sent to collections and they were about to have their car repossessed. And so this gift will not only be taking care of those bills, but also put them back on stable financial ground and it will save their only means of transportation. And the other gift is being given to a widow who lost her job due to the pandemic and is having trouble paying her rent. This gift will pay her rent and alleviate much of the stress she's been under. We're excited that the total of these Dollar Club gifts is $5,136. Wow. You know, being a part of the Dollar Club is easy. You just need to put in one extra dollar above your regular tithe and offering. When you give online or by text, it's a small gesture that the Lord uses to bless people in huge ways. And we want to say a big thank you to everyone who's been so faithful in your giving throughout this season we're in together. Yeah, in keeping with the theme of generosity, we are excited to share that Compass has been asked to be a distribution site for food boxes for families. This is a program that was initiated by the USDA as a way to get food straight from America's farmers to families throughout the country. It started this past Friday, and it's the first of many weeks that we'll be giving out a thousand boxes of food to families in need. Yeah, and what's really great is that all families are eligible. So make a note that we're distributing the food boxes every Friday from 7 to 10 a.m. So if you'd like one, plan to stop by the church this Friday and most especially help us get the word out to the community. There are so many people who would be greatly impacted by this. And if you'd like to volunteer to help, you can reach out to us at the web address on your screen. Social media is really one of the easiest ways to connect these days. And it's no surprise that it's become such a vital link between friends, family, and even the church during this time. You might have seen that over the past couple of weeks, we've hosted a few Facebook Live events from several ministries within Compass, and really, we're only getting started. Yeah, we have several great ones coming up, usually every Monday and Thursday. They include everything from an interest meeting about Compass Academy to discussions about marriage, tips for parenting, and more. So check out our Facebook page for the complete list of upcoming live events so you can be a part of the conversation. Now it's time to hand things off to our worship team for a couple of songs, then to Pastor Brian for a timely message on doubt as we conclude our sermon series called Disruption. Hey, we're so excited you're here with us. Let's worship together.
lift this up, let's sing this swing wide. church, we're going to continue to sing. We're going to continue to lift high the name of Jesus, to give him praise because he's so worthy of all of it. So let's sing this together in the darkness. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt We sing praise Praise the Father Praise the Son Praise the Spirit salvation Jesus for our sake you died Praise the Father Praise the Son Praise the Spirit Three in one God of glory Praise 
God, you are deserving of all the praise. God, everything that we could bring to you. So God, we choose even in a valley or even on a mountain, God, to lift your name high. God, you deserve it for all that you've done, for all that you're doing right now. And God, we even praise you for what you're going to do. God, thank you for this church. Thank you for the opportunity to worship together. God, we know how, how important it is to unite our hearts as one, God, in lifting praise to you. God, so thank you for this holy moment. God, would you speak to us now? And God, would you change hearts? God, we pray it all in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. Well, friends, welcome back to Compass Christian Church, Church at Home. Has the novelty worn off yet? Uh, many researchers around our country are saying that, man, the novelty is wearing off. People are getting weary of church at home. And, and yes, we're all weary uh, with this lockdown and quarantine, but can I just remind you not to grow weary, church. Uh, continue to share these messages, continue to engage. Just like many people were known for coming to church when we had live church 1.4 times a month, we don't wanna be those kind of people with church online. So continue to engage in worship, continue to share compass and share hope with people who need it. I don't know about you, but I've been amazed at how God has used this disruption series our 40 Days of Hope. I've been hearing stories, great stories. Most of this series was planned over a year ago, pre-pandemic, and yet God's Holy Spirit was working in the planning, working in the details, and he's been doing amazing things. It's, it's amazing how these messages and these topics have been so relevant to today. God knew what we needed at this time in our lives. And this weekend will be no different. This weekend we're talking about doubt. And this week... One of the greatest thinkers of our time went home to be with Jesus. His name is Ravi Zacharias. Ravi was an Indian-born, Canadian-American Christian apologist, a defender of the Christian faith. Zacharias was the author of more than 30 books and spent nearly his entire life, uh, as his mission statement says, helping thinkers believe and believers think. 
And yet, this was not always the case. If you know his story, you know that Zacharias was born on March 26, 1946 in Madras, India. His family moved to Delhi when he was quite young and he grew up there. His family was Anglican, but he was an atheist until the age of 17 when he attempted to commit suicide by swallowing poison. When he was in the hospital, a local Christian worker brought him a Bible and told his mother to read to him from John chapter 14. Zacharias said it was John chapter 14 verse 19 that touched him as the defining paradigm. Here's what that verse says. Because I live, you also will live. And that he thought, man, this may be my only hope. A new way of living, life, as defined by the author of life. He committed his life to Christ, praying that moment, Jesus, if you are the one who gives life as it was meant to be, I want it. <laughs> Please get me out of this hospital bed well, and I promise to leave no stone unturned in my pursuit of truth. And that's how he lived his life. But what about you? If you thought there was a chance that Jesus really is who he says he was, and who he says he is today, and the only one who can give life as it was meant to be, would you lean into the evidence? Would you search diligently for that kind of truth? You know, this is a broken world we live in, and it leaves people with a lot of questions, tough questions, soul-searching questions, and some of which we've committed to trying to address in this series. Now, I don't have all the answers. I can't resolve all the issues, but I am willing to search for the truth. What about you? You know, we've been talking in this series about the kind of obstacles that, that get in the face of people as they seek God and, and even Christians that want to fully experience God. Obstacles and doubt can certainly become one of those obstacles. Maybe you've been struggling with an issue in your life and you've been praying to God and, and yet you don't seem to be getting an answer from God and so you wonder, man, it feels like nobody's at home in heaven. Or maybe you've questioned whether God has forgiven you. And, and you know, according to the Bible, that, that you've received uh, Jesus, so you've received the forgiveness of your sins, all your sins, past, present, and future. But you have this residue of guilt and shame in your life, and you can't seem to get rid of it. And you wonder, am I really forgiven? Maybe you question whether the Bible can really be trusted today by thinking 21st century people. Maybe you've said to yourself, I think I'm a Christian, but maybe I wasn't sincere enough when I made that decision, so now I'm not so sure. Now, good news for you this weekend, friends. This is nothing new. For centuries, people have struggled with doubt. And when you're trying to decide what you believe about anything at all, there are always three options before you. Write these down. Number one, you can choose to believe. And when you choose to believe, that leads you to great clarity and great conviction. Secondly, you can choose to disbelieve, which, believe it or not, also leads to clarity and conviction. Or number three, you can choose to doubt. And friends, that sticks you in the middle somewhere, neither accepting nor rejecting the truth, which leaves you without any clarity, without any conviction. Doubt is a middle position that can maroon a person, strand them in a passive place where there is no strong joy, there is no strong passion, no strong conviction. It's just miserable. And maybe you find yourself there today. Let's say, for example, you've been struggling with your marriage and, and there hasn't been any adultery or abandonment or abuse, and yet you've let your relationship decline to the point that it's just a drag and you're frustrated. In fact, you're so frustrated that you're beginning to doubt whether you should even be married to this person. Now, you're a Christian, and you want to honor God, and you know that bailing out and getting a divorce is not God's will for you. That's the truth. So what are the options before you? Well, same, same three options. You can believe that truth, and that will take you to the place that every married Christian gets to sooner or later, right? It's either let things go and experience more frustration or say, we're going to get some counsel. We're going to work these issues out together, which leads to clarity and conviction. Or you can disbelieve the truth. You can say, I don't care what the Bible says. I'm just going to dump my spouse anyway. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, everybody in your life group, everybody on your ministry team, everybody uh, in, in, in your sphere of influence that cares about you and cares about Jesus, every pastor you talk to, every time you read the Bible, every time you pray, every reliable Christian friend is going to tell you exactly the same thing. This plan is disobedience to God. Don't do it. You'll destroy your life. Be faithful and God will reward you, which also brings you to a place of clarity 
and conviction. Or you can take that third option. You can choose to continue to flounder around in doubt. And again, it's miserable. I don't know what to do. I don't know if this is going to work out anymore. I don't know if I'm going to stick or if I'm going to run. And, and that ambivalence, that non-decision, it's miserable. You can maroon yourself there and kill the relationship by letting it decay. Now, I know people, and so do you, who struggle with this same thing over whether or not to make a commitment to Christ to step across the line of faith in Jesus. And you have those three options. Doubt is the most miserable. Now friends, here's the good news this weekend. The Bible is full of examples of people who found themselves enslaved or even marooned in a period of doubt and it was miserable for them too. Abraham doubted that God would give him a son as promised. His wife, Sarah, doubted and laughed at God's promise. And because of their doubt in God's word, they did some dysfunctional, sinful things that are still hurting our world today. Moses doubted that he had the capacity to lead the children of Israel out of bondage, slavery in Egypt. Job found himself having lost everything, body riddled with boils, friends calling into question his true character, and his wife <laughs> telling him to curse God and die. And he had his doubts that God even noticed and that God even cared. John the Baptist, who baptized Jesus, the cousin of the Lord Jesus, heard a voice from heaven say, God's voice, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, got to a place in his life where he began to doubt the identity and the deity of Jesus. Now friends, these guys are all players in the Bible, but there was a time in their lives where they all struggled with doubt. Yet once they learned to deal with their doubts, their ability to trust God got stronger and stronger and that's what made them heroes of the faith. So how did they get free? Well, we're going to find out, I think, by looking at the most famous doubter in the Bible. Anybody want to guess who that was? Yeah, you're right. Doubting Thomas. So turn to John chapter 20. Uh, grab your Bibles, John chapter 20. I'm going to start with verse 24. And we're going to read the story of this disciple who doubted the, that the resurrection of Jesus actually even happened. Starting in verse 24. It says, Now Thomas called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So this is after the resurrection. He's appearing to the other disciples. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. Now the resurrection account in this chapter in the Bible in verse 1 says, When Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early on Easter morning to care for the body of Jesus, she found it empty. Then she met the risen Lord Jesus, he told her, go to the disciples, tell, him, tell them that he had in fact risen from the dead just as he predicted he would. And she told some other friends first and then she went to the disciples and in verse 11 it says, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. So apparently Thomas wasn't the only one struggling with doubt. Then Peter ran to the tomb, saw for himself, and in verse 19 it says that Jesus then appeared to all the disciples at once and they believed. They all believed. It was great news. Unfortunately, Thomas was not there. Now when they reported back to him that they had seen Jesus back from the dead, risen from the dead, Thomas didn't believe it. Thomas had doubts. Now friends, the first step in gaining peace is to diagnose your doubt. Write that down. Diagnose your doubt. Don't just accept it. Diagnose it. Now, as Thomas experiences doubt, it becomes apparent that there are a lot of different contributors to his doubt. For example, doubts can come because we've been through a bad experience, like seeing a friend crucified. I mean, how could God let this happen? Uh, doubts can also come when we're cut off from the fellowship of Christian friends. Everybody was worshiping together, praying, comforting each other when Jesus appeared to them and Thomas was not there. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why he wasn't in community. I don't know why he isolated himself by skipping church and skipping life group. And, and because he did that, he denied himself some really important information. You know, doubts can also come and be empowered when they come by speaking before we process what we're seeing and hearing. Thomas didn't have all the facts and he expressed his pessimism instead of waiting, instead of reflecting on this astounding news about Jesus. Now if this is true for Thomas, I'm sure that you will agree that for all of us, doubt can come from a number of different places as well. So let's look um, 
for some light today and let's diagnose our doubts. You know, Lee Strobel, um, great apologist, uh, former atheist become Christian, he writes that doubts can come for several reasons. And here's number one. We can struggle with doubts because our knowledge is inadequate. Uh, Thomas doubted the resurrection. And friends, the reason why is because the only evidence he had at that point was hearsay. Uh, he didn't have all the evidence that we have today. He hadn't seen the Lord, and he didn't have all the evidence we have. And his, na his lack of knowledge set him up to doubt. Now listen, if somebody challenges your faith and asks you why you believe Jesus is God and you say, well, um, the Bible says so, <laughs> and they say, you believe in the Bible? Man, you must be kidding. You believe in that book that's full of myths and you don't know what to say next to that person? You don't know how to answer them? It can cause you to doubt. And that's why you ought to study. You ought to read books like Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ. Friend, Strobel used to be an atheist, and he would say today that it's intellectually harder for someone to, to have the faith, if you will, to be an unbeliever than to put their faith in Jesus and believe that Jesus was the Son of God. The facts are on our side, but you need to know them. Friends, Thomas was just one conversation away from deleting all his doubts. But if he hadn't gotten that information, his doubts might have neutralized him. Here's the second thing. We can struggle with doubts when our emotions fluctuate, right? Are your emotions fluctuating these days? You know, if you commit your life to Christ and you have that rush of emotion and tears and all that, and then those feelings fade, does that mean that your faith is fading? Well, friends, the answer is no. It just means that your feelings are fluctuating. Friends, you can't be on the mountaintop all the time. But if you think that a faith-driven emotional high is normal, then when you hit a, a valley, well, you know, you're going to hit some valleys. Maybe we, we kind of are in a valley right now. It can cause you to doubt the health of your faith. Listen, faith in Jesus is about a commitment of your will to follow him, not about feelings. In fact, you can be depressed and still be a faithful follower of Jesus. I know people who fit into that category, who are, are fighting every day with their depression, but also staying faithful and putting their trust in Jesus. This was John the Baptist's problem in Luke chapter 7. He was in jail. He was facing death. He was isolated. He was down. And that's the very time he was tempted to doubt. But when he refocused on his faith instead of on his feelings, his confidence and his freedom were restored. Here's number three. We can struggle with doubts because of our personality type. You know, some people are just more prone to accidents and illnesses. And, and just like that, other people are more prone to doubt. Some people are more prone to doubt than others. I think Thomas was. It's generally people with a melancholy uh, temperament, contemplative, analytical personality types. They just tend to think more deeply about things. And that's not a problem until they compare themselves to some happy-go-lucky guy who never struggles with doubt. And they begin to question, is there something wrong with me? Or on the other side of the coin, they, they start to doubt that guy's faith because it's never that easy for them. Now listen, can I say there's nothing wrong with him or you, right? You're just more contemplative, more analytical. You're going to need more answers and they're available. Number four, we can struggle with doubts because of past pain. Lee Strobel points out that the emotional scarring that we have in our lives can lead to doubts about truth, doubts about God, even the concept of authority. Now if you go through history and you look at the lives of the most famous atheists who ever lived, Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, right? Bertrand Russell, Madeline Murray O'Hare, Nietzsche. You look at their lives, every single one of them either had a father who died when they were young or abandoned them when they were young or a father that, that they had a horrible relationship with. Every single one. And friends, when you had a bad dad and you get around a bunch of people who say they're worshiping a, a heavenly father, you might doubt the wisdom of that. You have to learn that God is the father you wish you'd had in order to deal with your doubts. Or maybe some Christian or Christian group acted towards you in an unchristlike manner. And first let me say, man, I'm sorry if that is true. But that can fuel your doubts. But listen, just because somebody plays Beethoven poorly <laughs> doesn't mean that Beethoven was a bad composer. Sometimes we have to discover that God, Jesus, the whole church, every Christian in general shouldn't be dismissed because some Christians are hypocritical or just unkind. Here's number five. This is an important one. We can also struggle with doubts because of willful disobedience to God. 
One thing you got to give Thomas, he wanted to believe, right? He had his doubts, but he was looking for the answers. He wanted to believe. And friends, evidence can cure doubt. But deciding not to believe altogether, man, that's something else. Doubt says, I can't see it. I can't believe it. But unbelief says, I won't believe it. Doubt is honesty. In fact, leaning into your doubt can, can actually deepen your faith. But unbelief is stubbornness. And it's a refusal to even look at the evidence that's there. Doubt is looking for light. Unbelief is content with the darkness. So question, <laughs> do you think Snoop Dogg really wants to know the truth about a God who's going to judge the sexually immoral? I doubt it. You think, you think Bill Maher or, or Howard Stern really want to believe in a God who's going to hold the whole world accountable to his authority? I don't think so. Or, or how about when some Christian who is hiding a, a substance addiction or a pornography addiction or, or some sexual sin in their life, should we be surprised when they are troubled with doubts about God's love and God's word? I don't think so. Psalm 10, 4 says this, In his pride the wicked does not seek him. In all his thoughts there is no room for God. You know, sometimes Christians are mocked because they want to believe. I think there are a lot of people who just don't want to believe who just choose to disbelieve because, you know, if they change their position, it would require them to change their lifestyle or swallow their pride. And they don't believe for the simple reason that they don't want to. Blaise Pascal once said, there is uh, in faith, there is enough light for those who want to believe and enough shadows to blind those who don't. I think that's true. Friends, people doubt for all kinds of reasons. And if you want the freedom of a clear conscience and a solid, you know, strong heart, rather than just accept your doubts, you need to diagnose your doubts. And then you need to do this. Number two, attack. Attack your doubts as soon as possible. If you want to live with peace and you want to live with freedom, when doubt raises its head, you need to attack. Did you hear about the little old lady who was on a plane and uh, she was sitting there and she had her Bible out in her lap and, and this, this skeptic, this atheist came and this man sat down next to her and he saw she was reading this Bible and he thought, man, I'm going to give this lady a hard time. I'm going to take a few jabs at her. This will be fun. And so he turned to her. He said, ma'am, you, you believe what you're reading there. That's the Bible, right? She said, yes, it's the Bible and I, I believe it. You, you believe everything that's written in that book? She said, yes. I do. I believe everything that's written in this book. He said, you believe that Jonah was swallowed by a whale? And she said, well, actually, the Bible says he was swallowed by a big fish that God commissioned. But yes, I do believe that Jonah was swallowed by that fish. And he said, well, how can you even prove that? I mean, there's no way you can even prove that that happened. She said, you know what? When I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah. He said, well, what if you get to heaven and Jonah's not there? She said, well, then you ask him. <laughs> You know, she wasn't the kind of person who's going to coddle her doubts, right? She attacked them. Now, it, you got to hand it to Thomas, don't you? That's exactly what he does. Verse 26 says, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them this time. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, I think it's interesting, don't you? Stop there. That you know, he shows up again, and this time it really was just for Thomas. He said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand. Put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, I want you to look at what Thomas does here for a moment. You know, here's what he doesn't do. He's not in a bar crying somewhere because he's got his doubts. He didn't reject his Christian friends who believed in the resurrection thinking, we're just not on the same page anymore. No. He took some steps that actually enabled him to overpower his doubts and set him free. Listen, friends, Thomas intentionally put himself in an environment where he could discover the truth. Listen, when doubt comes... There are steps you can take that will put you spiritually on the offensive. Our dear departed brother, Ravi Zacharias, and interestingly enough, I had this in the message before his death this week. Uh, Ravi Zacharias wrote a book, Cries of the Heart, and he lists in that book some important ways 
that we can attack our doubts. Here's the first thing he says. Train ourselves to hear the language of God. And you know what he's talking about? He's talking about the scripture. What's God saying in the scripture? You know, if we think about this, we might be the ones who have left God's proximity because God's always there. And that's why we're doubting. But he, he says, man, we need to get back to the Bible. Did you know that the International Bible Society found that 87% of Christians do not read their Bible every day? Wow. You know, I, I try to read other books, sometimes good books, and many of them are good books about Jesus. But there's a difference between reading what somebody wrote about Jesus and reading the words of Jesus. There's power in the word of God. Romans 1.16 says, The gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Friends, the best way to attack your doubts is to read the Bible, read the truth of God's word every day. Same place, same time, every day. Just make a commitment. My head won't hit the pillow until my nose has been in the book, right? Live by that. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Are you positioning yourself to hear the words of Christ, the word of God, as you read the scripture each day and as you spend time in prayer? Here's the second thing Ravi says. He says the language of self is important. Oswald Chambers writes, Unless we train our emotions, they will lead us around by the nose and we will be captives to every passing impulse or reaction. You know what he's saying? He says we need to get intentional about what we download, right? You know, in the computer industry years ago, they coined that phrase garbage in. Yeah, you know, garbage out. You put bad stuff in your mind, in your heart, and you're going to get bad stuff out. Friends, if you're watching cynics on TV and you're walking around with your AirPods in, playing Lil Wayne in one ear and Justin Moore in the other, no wonder you're struggling with doubts about your spiritual life. Solomon said, as a man thinks, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart. So whatever you're putting in, friends, that's going to come out. Now on the flip side, Paul wrote this, Brothers, whatever is pure, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is true, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, uh, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. All those things he talks about. True, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Those things. You think about those things, friends. If you want to attack your doubts, start reading and listening to material that will build your faith instead of stuff that just reinforces your prejudices. Here's number three. The language of obedience. You know, obedience builds and strengthens our faith. Faith is the result of works, but also works result in faith. Think about it. Uh, Moses received proof of God's call after what? After he decided to obey. I, I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And those guys said, we're not going to bow down to the idol. We're going to choose to obey God even if we have to go into the fiery furnace. We believe our God is able to save us, but even if he does not, we're going into the furnace, king. And it was not until they obeyed and went into the furnace that they actually had an encounter with Jesus, an encounter with the living God after they obeyed. So language of obedience is pretty important if we want to attack our doubts. Number four, the language of friends. Spend time with people who have strong faith. Again, when Thomas was struggling with doubt, eventually he surrounded himself with people who were not struggling. And that is exactly the place where the Lord freed him of his doubts. Now, Jesus is probably not going to appear to you like he did to Thomas. He could, but, but probably not. But friends, just like Thomas, you will benefit from the fellowship of people with strong faith. If you have doubts about your faith, hang with people who have strong faith. If you have doubts about your marriage, quit going and hanging out with people who have already given up on their marriage and start to hang out with people who have strong marriages. If you're struggling with a godly direction for your life, hang out with people who are faithfully following God's will in their lives. When you see somebody with strong faith, friends, it didn't just happen automatically. It just didn't happen by accident or osmosis, right? They are doing things in their lives that are building that faith. And if you hang with them long enough, you will pick up what those disciplines actually are. So get in a life group. You can do that virtually and stay tuned. I got another word for you in a moment. Have lunch with a strong believer once or twice a month and they will help you disarm your doubts. Here's number five, the language of the church. Attend a Christ-honoring, Bible-teaching church every week. Now, I want to look at you in the eye and say, listen, stay tuned for reopening updates. 
They're coming soon. It's going to happen sooner than we thought, and we're excited about it. Uh, stay tuned for those. You've probably got some of those this week, but more to come. Now, friends, if you're only investing an hour or two a month in worship and study, man, you're watching church online just like every other week or once a month. or You, you know, you're immersed in a culture. No wonder you're struggling with doubts. We live in a culture that 16 hours a day, maybe 24 if you're up longer than that, seven days a week uh, is, is, is the other side of this. And if you're investing only an hour a month or every other week to hear from the Lord, I like you're about ready to turn this video off right now because we're almost to the hour, right? What do you expect? Thomas intentionally went to a place where he could ask his questions and get some solid answers. And if you want freedom from doubt, you should do that as well. In fact, starting June 1st, you don't even have to do it virtually. We are uh, at, at June 1st, we are allowing life groups to begin meeting in groups of 50 or less. So you, maybe your life group and another life group, you're going to get together. You're going to have church at home. You're going to worship. You're going to have a meal together. You're going to have communion together. And you can begin to engage in community, 50 or less, starting June 1st. Now, I read about an atheist who started checking out Christianity by attending a church like ours. And after a while, he decided he would just write down all the questions that were keeping him from becoming a Christian. And he had about 50 of them. Within just a few months, though, he got answers to all those questions and gave his life and his heart to Jesus Christ. Now, that would never have happened if he hadn't written those questions down, been intentional about seeking answers, gotten connected to a church that could help him answer those questions. Listen, Jesus promises everyone who follows him forgiveness of sin, that he will be with you all the time, that he will fill you with his own spirit, that he will give you fulfillment in this life, and you will spend eternity, you will have a future with him in heaven. And friends, if that's all true, don't you think that's worth checking out? So which would lead to this third thing, the last thing. I want to encourage you today, replace your doubts with faith. When Thomas saw Jesus alive, he saw the nail scars in his hands. He saw the spear wound in his side. His doubts just evaporated and he declared, my Lord and my God. The most outrageous doubter of the resurrection of Jesus utters one of the greatest confessions of the Lord who rose from the dead. Now friends, this statement wasn't just a compliment to Jesus. It is an accurate description of who Jesus is. Because he rose from the dead, Thomas had every right, and he was certainly exactly right, to identify him as both Lord and God, right? Not just a good teacher, not just a compassionate leader, Lord and God, Thomas's and ours. You know, he's the Lord and God of every person on the earth, even those who choose to disbelieve in him. Friends, if you have doubts... You can replace them with faith. Jesus told Thomas in verse 29, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You know what he's talking about, right? He's talking about us. You're probably never going to have the experience that Thomas had, but you actually have a lot of evidence to bolster your faith that Thomas didn't have. First of all, the reliability of Scripture. The New Testament hadn't even been written yet in Jesus' day. All these eyewitness accounts we have in the Scripture. The dating of our calendar by the life of Jesus. The permanence of the church even through thousands of years of persecution. The transformation of millions of lives. Some of your crazy friends, right, with their great testimony. Answers to prayer. Fulfillment of biblical prophecy even by secular people like Alexander the Great. And friends, the illogic of all the alternatives. John ends his report of Thomas's doubt-busting encounter with Jesus with these words in verse 30. He says, Jesus did many other miracles and miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And friends, I hope you will choose to do that today. Now let's go back to Thomas just for one second. Can you imagine what would have happened if Thomas, the disciple, the one we've labeled the doubter, <laughs> had chosen not to wrestle with his doubt? Friends, do you know that Christian history tells us that Thomas, doubting Thomas, was the very first missionary to India 
that he was actually martyred there for his faith and he became a hero of the faith to many that, that still talk about that in India today. And you're thinking, wait, 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 India, you mean to tell me that Ravi Zacharias actually had the opportunity to choose Christ for himself because, partly, because of the life and legacy of Doubting Thomas? Yes. Can you believe that? <laughs> Doubting Thomas set up an environment because of his faith that eventually led people like Ravi Zacharias who have touched millions of lives, who, who have helped many people step across the line of faith, all because of his faith. That, that's amazing. Friends, the path to peace and the antidote to doubt is faith, a choice to believe that Jesus is who he says he was, made on the basis of evidence, real evidence. And you can choose to make that choice today. I would encourage you, doubt your doubts. <laughs> believe your beliefs. Jesus told Thomas, and he tells us today, that he will give us the power to stop doubting and believe. And I hope you'll start down that road this moment today. Let me pray for us. Father, we are so thankful for your love and your grace in our lives. We're thankful that you give us things we don't even deserve. That, Lord, even when we doubt you, even when we choose to disbelieve, that you are a loving, good, heavenly Father that cares about us, that pursues us with your grace, your mercy. Lord, I pray for people today that have been doubting. I pray that, Lord, if they're a Christian, uh, just like I was writing in my journal in my office earlier, praying on my knees for them, Lord, that you would bolster their faith, that they would walk away from this day stronger in their faith and their trust for you. And Lord, for those who aren't believers, those who are still listening to the sound of my voice, that, that they would choose to lean into the evidence, that they would look at the real evidence that's there for the resurrection, and that they would choose to step across the line of faith and make a commitment to believe in you. Not to stay marooned in that middle position that causes people to be miserable, but to make a choice to believe. Father, we, we're just thankful that you love us. Continue to guide us through this time. Lead us back together again soon, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now friends, one of the things that keeps us from doubting uh, is the reminder that we have every single week about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We call that communion. And you know what's interesting? Man, if somebody predicts their own death, burial, and resurrection and then pulls it off, comes back from the dead, <laughs> appears to more than 500 people at the same time, that I just kind of go with whatever they say. I believe that whatever they say is true. So every week, friends, as Christians, we remind ourselves of that fact. We take bread that represents the body of Jesus broken for us. And we take juice that represents his blood that was shed for us, poured out for us on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And we are reminded of the great cost, what it cost God to buy us back from death and give us forgiveness and hope and eternal life. And we're reminded that we can trust his word. We can believe it's true. We don't have to doubt because the one we're putting our faith in is the only one who predicted his death, burial, and resurrection and pulled it off. He came back from the dead. So I would encourage you in these moments as a family uh, or, or a small group just to, to meet and take these elements of bread and juice and remember what God has done for you personally. And remember that you can put your faith in him. You can trust his word because he is the risen Lord. God bless you. We're so glad you got to worship online with us today. Yeah, as we close out our series on disruption, you know, we're so thankful that God has spoken to us in some really specific and relevant and powerful ways. And so we're excited to see him work in each of our lives. We're also excited to look forward to next weekend as we kick off a new series through the book of Hebrews that really focuses on how Jesus is greater than whatever we're going through, whatever we're experiencing, whatever we're facing in our lives. But as we close out our time together this week, let's remember we do three things, Compass. Love, love God, God, love people, people share, share Jesus. Jesus. God bless. Have a great week.